Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For the first of today's Florida compilation, we will be looking at the case of Nathaniel Brazil, a 13-year-old boy from Lake Worth in Florida. Nathaniel, who was often referred to as Nate, was born on the 22nd of September 1986. At the age of 13, Nate was in 7th grade at Lake Worth Middle School, where he was known to be a mild-mannered and likeable student. He enjoyed his time at school and maintained good grades. However, his home life was less than happy. He lived in an apartment with his mother, Polly Ann Powell, his two-year-old sister and his stepfather. He grew up in an environment surrounded by alcoholism and domestic abuse. The police had been called to the family home on multiple occasions due to domestic disturbance reports. In addition, his mother, Polly, had recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. The 26th of May 2000 was the last day of the academic school year. Polly was already at work at a retirement home when Nate left for school. He arrived at the bus stop at 8.30am holding a small bouquet of flowers and also a balloon to give to the girl that he liked, Dinora Rosales. Hidden in his backpack to mark the end of the school year, he had some water balloons. After having lunch on that day, Nathaniel was involved in a water balloon fight and he, along with 13-year-old Michelle Cordovas, were caught by the school counsellor, Kevin Hines. They were suspended for the remainder of the day and escorted from the grounds by Kevin. As Nathaniel walked away with Michelle, he told her that he had a gun and was going to return to the school to shoot Kevin, saying, Just watch, I'll be all over the news. At his house, Nate went to his bedroom and retrieved a 25 caliber handgun that he had stolen from his grandfather's house the previous weekend. He then rode his bicycle back to the school. Nathaniel entered the school grounds near the rear car park, an area that was designated for teachers and was spotted by the school security officer, Matt Baxter. Matt went after Nate but only found his abandoned bike. Nathaniel had run into the school building. By now, it was 3.25pm and Nathaniel wanted to see the object of his affection, Dinora. Knowing her timetable, he headed to classroom 301, the class of 35-year-old teacher, Barry Gruno. Barry had always been one of Nathaniel's favourite teachers, providing an encouraging environment for him to study, particularly when Nathaniel was mocked by his peers for his love of learning. Nate knocked on the door of the classroom and Barry came out into the corridor outside. Nathaniel asked to see Dinora and her friend, Von A. Ware. Barry said that he would not allow the girls to leave the classroom and instead suggested that Nate come inside. That offer was declined by Nathaniel. He continued to ask to see the girls and each time Barry refused. Nathaniel then pulled out the gun and pointed it directly at Barry's head. Students inside the classroom heard Barry saying, Stop pointing that gun at me, Nate. School CCTV footage showed that Nathaniel pointed the gun at Barry for nine seconds before pulling the trigger. Barry fell to the floor, having been hit between the eyes. Nathaniel ran. The teacher in the next class, John James, came out to see what was going on. Nate aimed the gun directly at John, saying not to bother him. John raised his hands and backed into the classroom. Nathaniel ran out of the building, walked into the street saw a police car and put his hands on his head and began to kneel. He immediately confessed that he had shot someone at school and that the gun was in his pocket. Nate was arrested and taken to the police station. Polly arrived home from work that day and was surprised when her son wasn't there. At around 5pm that evening, her sister called and informed her that Nathaniel had been arrested. During his video statement, Nathaniel can be seen asking detectives how Barry was doing. They told him that Barry was dead and Nathaniel broke down crying, sobbing. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? A memorial service for Barry was attended by about 1,600 people at the Good Shepherd United Methodist Church on Military Trail near West Palm Beach. 
Many of those in attendance were other 7th graders who were coming to terms with the violent and unnecessary death of an extremely popular teacher. Nathaniel served around 400 days in jail by the time that his case actually went to trial. During his time in confinement, he changed significantly. He no longer looked like a child. He had grown four inches, was broader, his voice deeper and a change from a baby-faced child to a sullen young man. For those who saw him for the first time since the shooting, the change was dramatic. The then Palm Beach County State Attorney, Barry Krischer, decided that the now 14-year-old Nathaniel would be tried as an adult. Robert O'Dell, who defended Nathaniel in court, called him one of the finest young men I ever met in 30 years of practice, but one that did a very stupid thing. He maintained that Nathaniel had brought the gun to school to intimidate people and that Barry's death had been an accident. However, the prosecutors said that Nathaniel had admitted pulling back the slide on his gun and this together with the pressure required to pull the trigger, proved that the shooting was not accidental. The jury agreed with the prosecution, and Nathaniel was found guilty of second-degree murder. The jury decided against a first-degree murder conviction that would have carried a mandatory life sentence in Florida. At the sentencing hearing, Nathaniel said to the judge, Words cannot really explain how sorry I am, but they're all I have. Barry's widow, Pam, came to the sentencing hearing carrying a quilt made by her husband's students. She told the judge, maybe tomorrow, another woman's husband, another little boy's daddy, and another great teacher won't be sacrificed in an angry, crazy moment. Nate was sentenced to 28 years in state prison without the possibility of parole, followed by another seven years of house arrest and probation. He is incarcerated at Jackson Correctional Institution with a scheduled release date of 18th of May 2028. Since being in prison, Nathaniel has earned his GED and certification as a paralegal. He works in the prison library and believes that the thought of ever getting in trouble with the law again is unimaginable. Many, including Nathaniel himself, believe that his sentence is too harsh in view of his age at the time the crime was committed. In an interview in 2020, he states that a 13-year-old boy is deemed by the law to be too young to drive a car, get married, join the military or vote, and yet he was sentenced as an adult for his crimes. He says that he is now a 33-year-old man, a positive influence among my peers, and a leader within the prison community. During his time at Jackson Correctional Institution, he has filed seven lawsuits and 500 administrative complaints against the prison system. His prison records show that there have been 15 disciplinary actions against him, ranging from lying, disrespect and violations of telephone privileges, to fighting, having a weapon and assault. Nathaniel was admitted to fighting in 2001 but claims that the weapon and assault claims are fabricated. Many believe that he should never be a free man due to the severity of his crime. However, some have commented that in interviews completed since his incarceration, Nathaniel's main concern is what people think of him, and that he is naive in believing that a 28-year sentence is sufficient for the pain and trauma he caused to Barry's family. The sentencing of children is always a contentious issue, but as always I'll be fascinated to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. That concludes today's story. If you're new to the channel, please click subscribe. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst! The gymnasium at Lake Worth Middle has been named after Barry, a one-time gifted basketball player. A scholarship fund has distributed a total of nearly $250,000 to hundreds of students in his name so that Barry's goals and values could continue through others. Goodbye. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be visiting Florida in the USA to look at the complicated lives of the King family. Terry Lee King was born in Florida on the 17th of April 1961. 
At around the age of 23, Terry and his girlfriend, Janet Little, started living together and they went on to have two children. First they had Derek, who was born on the 4th of May 1988, and Alex, who was born 14 months later on the 12th of July 1989. The couple struggled financially and the relationship broke down in 1992 when the boys were three and four years old. However, Terry and Janet continued to live in the same house for a further two years, during which time Janet gave birth to twin boys fathered by another man. Despite no longer being together, Terry and Janet co-parented the four boys. Sadly though, with minimal income, they could not afford to raise them. In 1994, they became aware of the Heritage Christian Academy, which was a crisis home for children. Reverend Steve Zepp, the director of the academy, took in all four boys and presented the idea of open adoptions. This is where the children lived with a new family, but were regularly in touch with their biological parents, Terry and Janet. Janet said that she was told that sometimes the best thing that you can do for your children is to give them up and she has always maintained that the couple were doing what they believed was in the children's best interests. Janet moved out of Terry's house but remained living in the area. Around this time, Terry secured a job at Pace Printing where he worked the 2pm to 10pm shift. The job was not well paid and therefore money was still a cause of concern. In 1995, after the boys had been at the academy for around eight months, it had to close down as the church could no longer afford the upkeep. All four of the boys were placed with new families. The twins went to a family in Pace and Derek was placed with Frank Lay, who was the principal of Pace High School, and his wife, Nancy. Alex went to another family but did not settle well. He cried all the time and within a month the family said that it wasn't going to work so Alex returned to live with his father, Terry. Unable to afford childcare, Alex would often accompany Terry to work. He would stay in the lunchroom, reading, colouring or even playing on his Game Boy. And when he was tired, he would drag two chairs together in order to go to sleep. He was exceptionally well behaved and, appreciating the struggles of being a single father, Terry's boss turned a blind eye to this unconventional arrangement. Over the next few years, Janet would often visit Alex and the twin boys, but after visiting Derek once at the Lay's house, she never returned. In 1997, Terry and Alex moved in with a family friend, Joseph Tibbles, and his 13-year-old daughter. They lived with them for about a year whilst Terry was trying to get his finances in order. In 1998, Janet married and moved away to Lexington, Kentucky. She claims that after the move, she stayed in contact with the twins and Alex, but no longer visited them. Over time, it is believed that Derek's behaviour declined and he started to get into minor problems at school. Derek could be unruly and rebellious, but was generally seen as popular, polite and fun. By the summer of 2001, things finally seemed to be falling into place for Terry. He had just bought a car and had moved into a rental house. The house had a large garden, which Terry really enjoyed working on, often with 12-year-old Alex at his side. Around the 25th of September 2001, Janet received a call from Nancy Lay about Derek. Janet said that Nancy told her that they could no longer cope with the 13-year-old as he was disrupting their lives too much. They had tried everything to help him, but it just wasn't working anymore. The following week, Derek went to live with Terry and Alex. Derek found the move difficult as he had had to leave his friends behind and was now living in a far more rural area. He went from having lots of friends and participating in sports and school activities to spending time with his brother at his father's place of work every evening. In October of 2001, the boys were enrolled into Ransom Middle School. Both of them were academically bright, above average students. There were a few teething problems with the boys settling into a new school and Derek into his new home. But when Terry spoke to Janet on the 14th of November, he said that things were now going great and the two boys were getting along well. Two days later, at 5.52pm on the 16th of November, Terry contacted Escambia County Sheriff's Office to report that his children were missing. 
He said that he did not believe that they had run away as they had seemed fine and nothing other than a Game Boy was missing. He had not seen them since he dropped them at school in the morning and he feared that they had been taken. The following day, Terry said that one of the boys, it is unclear whether this was Derek or Alex, called him to say that they knew he was looking for them but they wouldn't be coming back. Around this time, Terry withdrew the two boys from school. On November the 20th, Terry called the sheriff's office again to see if there was any news on the boys' whereabouts and then the following day, he re-enrolled the boys into school even though they were still missing. Thursday the 22nd of November was Thanksgiving and Terry had been due to visit his father, Wilbur. He did not show up. Wilbur, who did not speak to his son often, became concerned when he did not arrive as planned. Terry, meanwhile, was in contact with the local news to say that his sons were missing from home and that he had filed a missing persons report with the sheriff's office, but that investigators seemed to be doing nothing to find the boys. Two days later, Derek was found by Santa Rosa sheriff deputies in a wooded area in Pace, and he was returned to Terry. The following day, Sunday, November the 25th, Alex also returned home. That evening, the three of them were seen outside their home by neighbours as they left to go and visit a friend. They returned home at around midnight. About an hour later, at 1am on Monday the 26th of November, the fire brigade were called to Terry's home on the 1100 block of Muskogee Road. The house was burning on one side and it took approximately 30 minutes to contain the fire. When the firefighters entered the house, they discovered 40-year-old Terry's body. This was on the side of the house, which hadn't been touched by the fire. He had significant wounds to his head, and it was clear that he had been murdered. Both Derek and Alex were missing. A murder investigation was soon underway, with investigators trying to establish who could have had a motive to kill Terry. Whilst concern mounted for the two missing boys, Monday passed with little development in the case. Then, late on Tuesday afternoon, the boys were found having been dropped off at the sheriff's office by a family friend. They were safe and unharmed. Shockingly, later that day, the two brothers aged 13 and 12 were charged with killing their father. They were charged with an open count of murder, meaning that it would leave the prosecutors or grand jury to determine which degree of murder the boys would be prosecuted for. Under Florida law, juveniles can be tried as adults for any crime that is punishable by death or life in prison. The prosecutors still had to decide whether the boys would be prosecuted as adults and were convicted of first degree murder, they would automatically receive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The two boys were held without bail at a juvenile detention centre. On 29th of November, the prosecutor confirmed that they would be asking the grand jury to indict the boys on adult charges, and it was also likely that arson charges would be brought pending the outcome of the arson investigation. The following day, their father was laid to rest at the Eastern Gate Memorial Gardens after a service at Faith Chapel Funeral Home on Beverly Parkway in Pensacola. A newspaper report published on the 1st of December detailed information from an unnamed 40-year-old man who described himself as a close friend of Terry. This man stated that Derek and Alex believed that they were being psychologically abused by their father and that Alex had said that he wished his father was dead. This man went on to state that Terry was a control freak who did not allow the boys to interact with others. They had to return home straight after school and then Terry would pick them up and take them to his place of work. He also claimed that Terry had nailed the windows shut and installed double key locks on all of the doors in the house. The controlling behaviour was reportedly getting worse when Derek had returned to the family home, becoming the focus of his father's attention. At this point, Terry's interactions with Alex had become increasingly negative. During the newspaper interview, the man stated that he had received a telephone call from an unknown woman the previous Tuesday instructing him to drive slowly north on East Spencer Field Road in Pace. When he did so, he saw the boys coming out of the woods. This man then picked up the boys, took them to his home and contacted a friend who was a deputy sheriff. The boys told him that they had killed their father while he was sleeping and had then been hiding in the woods. 
The man then took the boys to the sheriff's office, where he stayed with them during their police interviews and was later allowed to get them dinner from a fast food restaurant. He said that he hoped to testify on their behalf due to what they had been through with their father. However, this newspaper report did not seem to line up with how many other people viewed Terry. Janet, the boy's mother, said that he was a strict but fair parent who didn't even shout at his children. She said that he didn't have a mean bone in his body and adored his children using the words quiet and passive to describe him. Joseph Tibbles, with whom Terry and Alex had lived for a year, described Alex as a lovely, well-mannered child and Terry to be a protective, loving father. His 13-year-old daughter, who knew Alex well, said that he had never uttered a bad word against his father. Terry's mother described him as a very giving person who would help anyone, and then his father stated that he was a quiet, hard-working man, a sentiment echoed by his colleagues at the printing company. On the 11th of December, the two boys were indicted on adult charges of first-degree murder. Just before the indictments were returned, 40-year-old Ricky Marvin Chavis, the unnamed family friend from the earlier newspaper report, was arrested after testifying at the grand jury proceeding. He was charged with accessory after the fact, a crime that could lead to a potential 30-year prison sentence. The police believed that the boys had called him from a convenience store after setting their house on fire and told him what they had done. He took them to his home and washed their clothes, even though he knew that they had killed their father. At this stage, the nature of Ricky's relationship with the boys was unclear, but he had obviously been known to Terry, who had given him permission to pick Derek up from school. Ricky, who had a 1984 conviction for sexually abusing two 13-year-old boys, was held on a $50,000 bond. That evening, his mobile home was searched by the police the home had elaborate security precautions. It was surrounded by a tall wooden fence that required an electronic keypad to open. There was electric wire over the fence, numerous warning signs and several surveillance cameras. His neighbours said that they did not know him well but would often see teenage boys at his home at all hours of the day and night. At a hearing on 28th December 2001, the two boys were brought in wearing jail-issued green jumpsuits, handcuffs and shackles, looking young and vulnerable, and with Alex barely able to see over the witness box, their appearance was dramatically at odds with the details of their confessions. It was stated that Alex had come up with the idea to kill their father, and after initially deciding to use a hammer, they changed to an aluminium baseball bat. It was however Derek who attacked Terry, approaching him while he was asleep in his recliner chair and hitting him on the left side of his face and forehead with the baseball bat. He swung a second time but missed and hit a lamp, but then continued to hit his father approximately 10 more times. The attack was brutal and deadly. Additionally, investigators have found a disturbing note in the family home which had been written by Alex. The note read, my life used to be cloudy before I made friends with Rick. I had a whole lifetime ahead of me, and I didn't know what to do with it. I had no goals. I was confused. Rick let me see what I didn't understand. Life isn't about having a job. My ultimate goal in life now is what his is. It is about sharing your life with someone else's. Before I met Rick, I was straight, but now I am gay. It was established that Ricky had let the boys stay at his home when they ran away on the 16th of November, before returning them home the following week. During Alex's confession to the police, he said that his father had been mentally abusing him, but that he did not know this until Ricky had told him. Alex also claimed that Terry was not his biological father. Terry's brother, Greg King, believed it was Ricky who had convinced Alex of this. The request for bond was denied and the boys showed no emotion throughout the proceedings, even when the prosecutor, David Rimmer, showed crime scene photographs, including one of their dead father. With the trial date being delayed, the boys and Ricky all remained in custody. In March 2002, it was reported that both boys had been trying to harm both themselves and others whilst in prison. Also, Ricky had attempted to get a message to Alex by carving it in the jail recreation yard. Alex, don't trust, was spotted scratched with a small rock into a cement floor. 
the message was unfinished. By April 2002, Alex and Derek had changed their story. On the 9th of April, they testified in front of a grand jury that Ricky had killed their father and that they were outside of the house when the murder occurred. The following day, Ricky was indicted on further charges, first degree murder, arson and the sexual battery of Alex. This had no effect on the murder charges that Alex and Derek faced. All three pleaded not guilty to murder and, in an unusual move, all three would be tried for the same crime with two separate juries, one for Ricky and one for the boys. At the end of August 2002, the jury selection began for both trials. Ricky would be tried first, with Alex and Derek going to trial immediately after. At Ricky's trial, the brothers testified that it was Ricky who had killed their father. The boys stated that they had to leave the back door unlocked so that Ricky could sneak in on the night of the murder. When Terry and the boys returned home from a friend's house at around midnight, Alex unlocked the door. The two boys played some games and then Derek fell asleep. Ricky crept in, woke Derek and told them to go out of the back door and get in the trunk of his Nissan Maxima. The next thing they remember was being at Ricky's house and him telling them what he had done to their father. They said that Ricky convinced them to take the fall for his crime because they would be able to get away with it due to their age and that they could claim self-defense. The boys had wanted to protect their friend but then changed their story because they did not want to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Both of the boys said that Ricky had convinced them that their father was mentally abusive Ricky's attorney, Michael Rollo, disputed the boys' evidence and pointed out the discrepancies between this and their previous testimony. He also revealed that when the fire was started, a variety of liquids were used as an accelerant. Kevin Fedot, a lieutenant with the State Fire Marshal's office, testified that the shoes that Alex and Derek had been wearing on the night of the murder were covered with something resembling paint thinner, a commonly used accelerant. The boys had also testified that Ricky and Terry had struggled before the murder, but there was no evidence to support this. A psychologist testified that Derek had all the signs of a classic psychopath. Superficial charm, constant lying, no emotional responsibility and a lack of remorse or empathy. Their mother, who was now going by the name of Kelly Marino, testified that the boys had confessed to the murder during her visit to them after their arrest. Tapes of the boys' earlier confessions were played in court. These perfectly matched the crime scene. They included Alex's detailed description of his father after the attack and how Terry had been gasping for breath in his last moments. The accuracy in this description would seem unlikely for someone who had never witnessed a person dying. Due to the lack of any evidence of Ricky's direct involvement in the murder, the defence asked for the case to be thrown out. This request was denied. The jury began their deliberations on Ricky's guilt on Friday the 30th of August and after around seven hours, they finally reached a verdict. This verdict would remain sealed until the brother's trial was completed so as not to affect the outcome. At Alex and Derek's trial, when called to testify, Ricky invoked his Fifth Amendment right to protect against self-incrimination. Much of the testimony echoed that given in his previous trial, Alex's attorney, James Stokes, said that Ricky convinced the boys that they were being mistreated. He then killed Terry and convinced them to take the fall for his actions. Defence attorneys questioned whether Terry had become aware of what Ricky had been doing to Alex and this could have been the motive for Ricky killing Terry. They also claimed that the scope of the investigation had been far too narrow, only focusing on the boys, so Ricky's involvement, such as checking his clothes for evidence, may have been missed. The jury of three men and three women began their deliberations on Friday the 6th of September and five hours later a verdict was given. Derek and Alex King were both found guilty of the second degree murder of their father Terry and of setting their house on fire to cover up their actions. Ricky's verdict was also unsealed. He was found not guilty of murder. Many petitions and campaigns for leniency were soon underway with arguments made that at the age of 12 and 13, the boys should never have been tried as adults. 
The case caused a divide in public opinion, with some saying that they should be held accountable for this violent crime, whilst others felt that at such a young age, they should be treated as children, not adults, and considered for help and rehabilitation and not harsh punishment. Derek and Alex's sentencing was delayed, whilst defence motions for a new trial were considered. The defence attorneys sought a new trial based on two points that the jury returned an improper verdict and that the assistant state attorney was guilty of prosecutorial misconduct when he tried three people for one murder. The assistant state attorney stood by his decision arguing that three people were involved, that Derek had swung the fatal blows, Ricky had orchestrated the attack and Alex had participated in it. In yet another twist to this ongoing case, The judge then threw out the murder convictions against Derek and Alex and ordered prosecutors and defence attorneys to begin talks to settle the case. The judge stated that the boys' trial was unfair and that they did not receive due process of law. He cited a series of unusual and bizarre events, including conflicting statements and testimony, and the fact that he had been forced to secretly open the sealed verdict from Ricky's trial early due to the possibility that all three defendants could have been found guilty on conflicting evidence. He stated that a new trial would be ordered, but this would take several weeks, which he hoped would provide the time for the matter to be settled in mediation. In early November, mediation commenced, and on Friday the 15th, an agreement was reached. The brothers were convicted of third-degree murder. Derek was sentenced to eight years, and Alex to seven both with credit for the year that they had already spent in Escambia County Jail, Alex became the youngest prisoner in the state system. Ricky went on trial in February 2003 for kidnapping and molesting Alex. The boys testified at the trial, but were seen as vague, evasive and unreliable witnesses. Ricky was acquitted of kidnapping and 10 counts of lewd or lascivious battery. However, he was convicted of false imprisonment and immediately sentenced to five years in prison. The following month, Ricky's third trial began, this time for the accessory charge. He was found guilty of accessory after the fact to first degree murder and evidence tampering. He was immediately sentenced to 30 years on the accessory charge and five years for evidence tampering. This was the maximum allowed for both crimes, that these would run concurrently. Ricky remains in prison in Florida and is not scheduled to be released until 2032. On 9th of April 2008, 18-year-old Alex was released from custody after serving six years in prison. He went to live with Catherine Medico, a former University of West Florida professor who co-authored a book about the case and believed that the boys were not to blame. Derek was released the following year and was planning to live with his grandmother. That concludes today's story. Thanks for listening to The Case. Please support the channel by clicking like, subscribing and commenting. There is also a buy me a coffee link on the about page. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I always thought that Florida connected just to Georgia. But thanks to this case, I now realise it goes as far across as Alabama. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the lives of Dahlia and Michael DiPolito from Florida. This is a fairly recent case which gained a lot of publicity in the United States, so some of you may well be familiar with it. However, with all of the twists and turns in this story, I thought it was too interesting a case to not narrate it. Dahlia Mohammed was born on the 18th of October 1982 in New York. Her father, an insurance agent, was Egyptian, and her mother, Randa, was born in Peru. Dahlia had two siblings, a brother named Amir, and a sister called Samira. They were a religious, close-knit family, and when Dahlia was 13 years old, they moved to Palm Beach County in Florida. Here, the family lived in a middle-class gated community where the children had a solid upbringing, spending time together at family dinners, days out, and annual holidays. Dahlia grew into a confident, friendly and bubbly young woman who would go on to earn her real estate license. However, the real estate market was tough and Dahlia was driven by money. She enjoyed the finer things in life and wanted to make money quickly, so alongside her real estate career, she began working as a paid escort. 
In October 2008, 26-year-old Dahlia's services were requested by a man by the name of Michael DiPolito. Michael is also known as Mike, so if you hear either during the story, I am talking about the same person. Mike, who was 12 years older than Dahlia, was originally from Philadelphia. He had previously been arrested for running an investment scam, collecting over $150,000 from investors. He pled guilty to the crimes of organised fraud, unlicensed telemarketing and grand theft, and he was sentenced to two years in prison, with 28 years probation and ordered to pay restitution. Michael was a charming, likeable guy, and similar to Dahlia, he craved a lavish lifestyle. The pair immediately embarked upon a passionate relationship, despite Mike being married at the time to a lady by the name of Maria. On the 2nd of February 2009, less than four months after they met, Dahlia and Michael got married at the local courthouse, just five days after his divorce from Maria was finalised. Dahlia told her mother, Randa, about her marriage by showing her mother her ring finger. Randa thought she had got engaged and was far from impressed to find out that her daughter was actually married. The couple moved into Mike's apartment in Boynton Beach and began their married life together. They seemed to be head over heels in love and enjoying the honeymoon period of their whirlwind romance. Unfortunately, it would seem that Michael's criminal past was coming back to haunt him. After six years on probation with no problems, he suddenly began generating a lot of police interest. He was stopped and questioned by the police on multiple occasions after tip-offs that he was dealing drugs. The police never found any evidence of this. On the 5th of August 2009, Dahlia left home just before 6am. She made the short drive to LA Fitness to complete her morning workout. At 6.21am, she missed a call on her mobile phone. She returned the call a few minutes later, speaking to Sergeant Frank Ramsey of the Boynton Beach Police Department. The sergeant asked her to return home as soon as possible. As she approached her apartment, she saw that it was surrounded by police cars. Her apartment door was wide open and the area had been cordoned off with yellow police tape. Dahlia found Sergeant Ramsey, who informed her that there had been a disturbance at her house. Shots had been fired and that her husband, Michael, had been killed. Dahlia collapsed into the sergeant's arms, crying hysterically, before being taken to the police station. Upon arrival, Dahlia was led to an investigation room where she was asked if she knew of any enemies that Michael had, or if she knew of anyone who would want him dead. Dahlia mentioned that Mike was on parole for the investment scam, and so it could be assumed that perhaps it was something to do with that. Dahlia was then asked if she wanted him dead, and she insisted that she knew nothing. However, the police already knew otherwise. Five days earlier, on the 31st of July, the transfer of Michael's apartment solely into Dahlia's name was complete. She had convinced Michael to do this in order to protect his assets. On this day, she made contact with an old flame by the name of Mohammed Shihada. They had loosely remained in touch over the years, and Dahlia confided in Mohammed that she needed to get out of her marriage. According to Mohammed, Dahlia did not want a divorce, she wanted Michael dead. She claimed that Michael was physically and mentally abusive towards her, although there was not any evidence to back up these claims. Initially, Mohammed thought that Dahlia was joking, but soon realised that she was deadly serious. Concerned for both Michael's safety and that he could be implicated if Dahlia went ahead with the plan, Mohammed approached the Boynton Beach Police Department and informed them that Dahlia was planning on hiring an assassin to murder her husband. Mohammed agreed to work with the police to establish exactly what Dahlia planned to do. On the 1st of August 2009, Mohammed arranged to meet Dahlia in his car at a mobile gas station, but unknown to Dahlia, the car had been fitted out with cameras and recording equipment. When Dahlia arrived, she got straight down to business. There was no small talk. She wanted to know how Mohammed could help her in the plan to get her husband killed. Mohammed told her that he knew someone who could kill Michael for $7,000 plus a $1,200 deposit that would need to be paid straight away. She agreed to pay it all, handed over the deposit and two pictures of Michael. Two days later, on Monday the 3rd of August 2009, Dahlia met her supposed hired hitman in a CVS car park. The hitman was actually an undercover police officer by the name of Whitey Jean. Again, the car had been fitted with cameras and recording equipment. 
As Dahlia got into the car to discuss the details of her husband's murder, she was relaxed, bordering on flirty with Whitey, stating that she may look like a cute little girl, but she is tougher than she looks. Dahlia told Whitey that she wanted her husband murdered as soon as possible. Whitey explained to Dahlia that she needed to be away from the house at the time of the murder. They agreed that she would go to the gym early on Wednesday morning, at which point Whitey would break into her apartment, making it look like a robbery and shoot her husband dead. Whitey asked her if she was sure that she wanted to go ahead as, after they parted ways, there would be no way to call off the murder, to which Dahlia replied that she was 5,000% sure. Shortly after Dahlia left for the gym on the morning of the 5th of August, the police banged on the door of Dahlia and Mike's apartment where Mike was still sleeping. He opened the door to find the police everywhere and was informed that he needed to accompany them to the police station as his wife had hired someone to kill him. Michael was taken to the police station and shown the tapes of Dahlia attempting to arrange his murder at the same time as Sergeant Frank Ramsey was telling Dahlia that her husband had been killed. As the police continued to question Dahlia, she was adamant that she knew nothing of the crime. During her interview, the police brought in Whitey, still posing as her hitman, but she denied ever having seen him before. The police then told her that Whitey was in fact an undercover officer, and that they had recordings of her trying to arrange Michael's murder. The police declared everything they knew about her plan, and informed her that she would be charged with solicitation to commit first degree murder. Even in the face of so much evidence, Dahlia kept claiming that she was innocent. In the absence of a confession, the police decided to shock Dahlia into a reaction, bringing Michael to the doorway of the interview room to show Dahlia that he was still alive. Dahlia begged him to come into the room and talk to her. Understandably, he refused. In addition to the secret filming that had been collected as evidence of Dahlia's plan, at that time, the Boynton Beach Police Department were being recorded as part of the US TV show, Cops. As Dahlia and Michael came face to face for the first time since she believed him to be murdered, the entire event was caught on camera both inside and outside of the room. Before Dahlia had even been formally charged, the police department had released the video of her reaction to the news that her husband had supposedly been murdered on social media. This resulted in an influx of interest from national and international press. By the time she left the police station to be transported to jail, large numbers of the press were waiting. Dahlia continued to maintain her innocence. Once at the jail, she phoned her mother to tell her what had happened and that she had done nothing wrong. Surprisingly, her second phone call was to her husband, Michael, asking him to come and see her at the jail and also to ask for his help getting an attorney. Needless to say, he refused on both counts, but still gave her some advice on how to survive her time in jail. As the prosecution prepared for trial, it came to light that Michael was even luckier to be alive than he had at first realised. A few weeks before the botched hitman attempt, Dahlia had bought him a Starbucks iced tea. He took a sip, but as it didn't taste right, he spat it out. He was ill for a couple of weeks afterwards. Although he did not think much of it at the time, it later transpired that Dahlia had told Mohammed that she had put antifreeze in the iced tea in an attempt to kill her husband. The trial started in June 2011, by which time Michael had divorced Dahlia. The prosecution relied heavily on the video recordings to make their case. Whilst there was concern that Michael may not be a credible witness due to his criminal past, he came across as very likeable on the stand. He owned up to his past, even making a joke about it when the defence attorney mentioned the fact that he was on probation in virtually every sentence. The prosecution also brought into evidence a series of text messages between Dahlia and another ex-boyfriend which talked of planting drugs on Mike and what they could do together once he was out of the picture. The defence, however, told an entirely different version of events. They claimed that whilst the tapes showing Dahlia were obviously real, they were in fact acted. They claimed that Dahlia and Michael had come up with the idea of making a video, releasing it on YouTube, in order to attract the attention of reality TV producers. They accused Mike of being vain and desperate for fame. Dahlia did not take the witness stand. 
This story of producing a video for reality TV had never been mentioned in any of Dahlia's interviews and was told for the first time in court. Mike said that it was a complete lie. In just three hours, the jury found Dahlia guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Following the trial, Michael was interviewed and said he was 5,000% happy with the sentence. However, that is not where this story ends. Three years later, in 2014, Dahlia's conviction was tossed out due to an issue with her previous trial. During the jury selection process, the judge should have questioned the prospective jurors individually regarding their knowledge of the case. However, this questioning was actually completed as a group. When one prospective juror revealed to the group that she had read about Dahlia's attempt at poisoning her husband, the whole jury should have been dismissed, but this never happened. As such, there would need to be a new trial. Dahlia remained on house arrest, awaiting her second trial. In 2015, she hired two high-profile lawyers. They agreed to her conducting a television interview, the first time she had publicly spoken about the case since her arrest. This was a clear attempt to rehabilitate her image with the general public, but when questioned about the videotapes, she said that she could not answer any questions on the advice of her legal team. At a pre-trial hearing in February 2016, Dahlia's lawyers attempted to get the case dismissed. For the first time, Dahlia took the stand and again stated that she was innocent and that the videos were part of a plan that she, Michael and Mohammed had to become reality TV stars. The prosecution immediately tore this story apart. Why had this never been mentioned before the trial? Where were the scripts? Why couldn't you see the actors clearly in any of the videos? The defence lost the hearing and the motion to dismiss failed. The second trial began in November 2016. The prosecution relied on the strong video evidence and did not call Mike to testify this time, presenting a more slimmed down version of what they believed would be a certain conviction. The defence went for a different approach. They abandoned the reality TV defence and attacked the way in which the police had handled the case, accusing them of exaggerating Dahlia's crimes for the sake of the TV show, Cops. As the defence completed their closing argument, they dropped another bombshell. They asked the jury to give Dahlia her freedom back so that she could return to her family and her infant son. It would transpire that, during Dahlia's house arrest, a repairman by the name of Robert Davis had visited her house. The two had got talking, fallen in love, Dahlia had become pregnant and given birth, all during her time on house arrest. When the jury came back with their verdict, they were deadlocked, split 50-50 between guilty and not guilty. The judge declared a mistrial. The state attorney immediately said that they would take Dahlia to trial once again. In June 2017, the third trial began. This time, the prosecution went back to their original strategy of bringing in all available evidence, including testimony from Michael. The defence returned to the reality TV show defence, claiming that the couple had got the idea from an episode of the TV show, Burn Notice. They also claimed that the Boynton Beach police had blown the events out of proportion for the sake of the TV show, Cops. This time it took the jury just 90 minutes to find Dahlia guilty. She was sentenced to 16 years in prison. She currently remains in prison at Lowell Correctional Facility in Marion County, Florida, where, unless any further appeals are successful, she will remain until 2031, when she will be 49 years old. Her legal team continue to claim that she is one of the most misunderstood women in America and maintain her innocence. Meanwhile, Dahlia's son is being raised by her mother and sister. Michael has moved on with his life. Now 50 years old, he is free from probation after paying the restitution and he remains living in Florida. That concludes today's story. Please add any comments down below. As always, I'll be interested in reading your views. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. One of the police officers on the stand had to read out rather explicit text messages which proved rather embarrassing for him and all those listening. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Hank Earl Carr and the heartbreaking series of events that took place in Tampa, Florida on the 19th of May 1998. 
a day that would change the lives of so many forever. Hank was born in the early hours of the 31st of January 1968 after a difficult labour. He was born with hyaline membrane syndrome, a sometimes fatal disease that leaves a baby's lungs so stiff that they struggle to open them. At that time, survival rates for this disease were far lower than they are today, and in many cases, as the baby struggled to breathe, their chest muscles would tire and they would pass away. Hank survived, but as a baby and toddler, suffered from ongoing breathing problems and also had severe asthma attacks. As a result, his mother, Gail, lived in constant fear that something would happen to her son. Hank was incredibly smart. He began walking early and was reading by the age of three. His father, Harold, was a strict and unforgiving man and his parents divorced when Hank was still just a young toddler. Hank lived with his mother, but still had regular contact with his father. Shortly after her divorce, Gail got married to a man by the name of Don Cox and the family moved to Bradenton in Florida. When Hank started school, it was clear that he was incredibly intelligent, but he would not behave or follow the rules of the school. He was assessed as being in the top 1% for his age academically and also diagnosed with an attention deficit disorder. By the age of seven, it was decided that he should be prescribed Ritalin, a drug that helps with hyperactivity, but which can be habit-forming. The medication worked well for Hank, increasing his ability to stay focused and reducing his behavioral problems. His mother enrolled him into a variety of activities to keep him occupied. He learned to tap dance, attended karate lessons and astronomy class. He enjoyed swimming and American football and developed a love of drawing and was hoping that one day he would become a cartoon illustrator when he was older. The family then moved to Barnesville, Georgia, when Don got a job at a glass factory that paid better than his work as a truck driver. Barnesville, which is around 60 miles south of Atlanta, is a small city that had a population of just under 5,000 at the time. It was a relatively quiet place where many families had lived for generations. Hank struggled to fit in, and by the age of 10 had become increasingly aggressive, had stopped listening to his teachers and parents, and would often shake down other children for money. Although small for his age, he was tough and strong. Five years later, the family moved to Englewood in Florida, and against his mother's wishes, Hank's doctor took him off of Ritalin. After being on this drug for eight years, the withdrawal hit him hard. He was plagued with migraines and nausea, and he became hyperactive, jittery and tense. He struggled to sit still, and would eat his meals pacing around the room. It was around this time that Hank had his first run-in with the law, for drinking alcohol on the beach, and then breaking into a vending machine. His behaviour continued to worsen, becoming ever more disruptive and aggressive. His mother tried her best to discipline him, but without success. Eventually, believing that Hank's friends were a big part of the problem, she said that he could no longer see them. He refused. His mother stated that he could stay at home and follow her rules or he could leave. So, at the age of 15, Hank left home. He became friends with another boy, 16-year-old Roger Lee Stables, who was also homeless. They would sleep in abandoned cars, get in fights together and steal whatever they needed. Numerous run-ins with the law would follow, Hank was arrested for stealing a car and charged with battery, but did not receive a custodial sentence. However, at the age of 18, Hank was convicted of burglary, theft and forgery in Sarasota County and sentenced to two years in prison. During his time there, he was determined to be viewed as top dog. Various infractions were noted, locking a guard in the prison freezer, wrapping a towel over an inmate's head and beating him badly smashing an inmate in the face for changing the TV channel, attacking a kitchen worker and throwing stew into his face to name but a few. One of Hank's reports read that Carr has a negative attitude and disregards all rules and regulations and blames everyone but himself for all of his problems. Despite his behaviour, Hank was released after 18 months in the June of 1987. He was put on strictly supervised probation but within minutes of meeting his probation officer, he had told them that he would not be sticking to their rules. He returned to live with his mother and stepfather and started work installing sliding doors. However, he had no respect for authority and was fired during his first week. Less than two months after moving back with his mother, 
She had kicked him out of the house again due to his difficult and violent behaviour. Living back on the streets, Hank regularly got into fights and just as his probation was about to be revoked, he disappeared. However, by February 1988, he was back in prison after stealing a guitar. He was sentenced to three years, but was released after just six weeks due to overcrowding problems. At this point, Hank moved in with his girlfriend, 16-year-old Kathy Stevens. Kathy had moved out of her family home and was keen to take on a traditional wife's role for him. Within a month, Hank had started to physically abuse her, once hitting her so hard that her eye bled for a week. In the August of 1988, Kathy's parents arrived to take her home. She was pregnant and gave birth to Hank's first child, a boy, a few months later. In May 1989, Hank was back in prison serving a two-year sentence for burglary, drug possession and also assaulting a police officer. He was released after a year, but was soon in trouble once again for beating a man and threatening to gut him. He was put under community control, but disappeared after attending just one meeting with his parole officer. In 1992, at the age of 24, Hank moved with his then-girlfriend Belinda Simpson to Marietta in Ohio. Within months, Belinda had filed a restraining order to keep him away from her and her nine-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. The court documents showed that at one point he beat the children for jumping on the furniture to the point where he caused the young boy to be bleeding from his nose and mouth. Hank agreed to attend counselling, but was thrown out of that for violent behaviour. Many of the women who knew Hank, even those who he viciously beat, described him as someone who could be very charming and that he could be incredibly romantic. But, as is so often the case in abusive relationships, once he had won the woman over, his behaviour changed and he would become incredibly violent. Those who knew him said that he always needed to be in charge. For example, if he didn't like the clothes that his girlfriend wore, he would simply rip them off of her. In the bars of Marietta, the violence continued. Hank once bit off a chunk of a man's ear, bragging that, He was lucky, I gave it back so they could sew it on. He never had a job and would get attention and free drinks by performing backflips in local bars. He was eventually banned from almost all of them. One of his neighbours, Kelly Beaver, was assaulted by Hank. They still have no idea why and they lost all of their front teeth as a result of this attack. In the November of 1992, Hank approached a woman by the name of Evelyn Sachs. This was outside the Four Seasons Bar on 2nd Street in Marietta. As he approached her, he said, you have the most elegant neck, and then proceeded to sweep her off of her feet. He was charming and romantic, but within a very short space of time, he had once again become abusive and violent. Within a year, Evelyn had suffered numerous beatings, and, now pregnant with Hank's daughter, had been infected with a sexually transmitted disease and was repeatedly stolen from. In January 1994, Evelyn gave birth to their daughter, Tamara, with Hank telling his mother that it was the happiest day of his life. The relationship continued, but Evelyn discovered that Hank was having an affair with Bernice Bowen, a young mother of two children, a girl named Kayla, and a boy, Joey. Pregnant once again, Evelyn left Hank, taking Tamara with her. She would later give birth to a boy who she named John Paul. Hank never met his son. As Hank's legal troubles grew and warrants were issued for his arrest, he and Bernice left on a motorcycle and went to South Dakota. They went on a spending spree with money that Bernice had made from the sale of a house. During this time, Bernice left her children with her mother, Connie. The couple then decided to set up home in Tampa, Florida, where they lived in a small garage apartment on East Crenshaw Street with Bernice's two children. Bernice worked at the local Kmart and also as a dancer at the Starlight Lounge Strip Club in Nebraska Avenue. Whilst Bernice was working, Hank looked after the two children. Bernice was often seen with black eyes and bruises on her neck and arms, which she would cover with makeup. Nevertheless, she loved Hank and said that she loved how good he was with her children. Those who knew her pleaded with her to get out of the relationship. Even their landlord was scared of Hank, stating that Hank would often be carrying multiple guns when he went to collect the rent. Despite being wanted in four states, Hank was able to trade guns undetected in Tampa by using an alias. There were also allegations of child abuse. 
Hank was anonymously reported for allegedly dropping Joey on his head after the small child had wet himself. Despite this, however, no signs of abuse were found. Others stated that Hank was very proud of the children and was very close to them, particularly Joey. On the 19th of May 1998, Hank, Bernice, six-year-old Kayla and four-year-old Joey were due to go swimming. However, they never made it to the pool that day, and what started out as a regular morning for all involved turned into one of the deadliest days in the history of Tampa Police Force. At 9.50 that morning, Bernice and Hank arrived at a Tampa fire station on the corner of Nebraska Avenue and Hannah Street. Hank was driving and Bernice was sitting in the front passenger seat of the car. In the back seat was Bernice's son, Joey. They rushed into the fire station and begged for help. Joey had been shot in the head. Despite the firefighters' best efforts, Joey could not be saved. Within minutes of Joey's death, Hank sped away from the fire station, returning home to the place where Joey had been shot. The police arrived and a seemingly distraught Hank told them that the shooting had been an accident and that the gun had accidentally gone off, shooting Joey in the head. When asked, Hank gave his name as Joseph Lee Bennett. It was the name of Joey's biological father and a man who had no criminal record. Hank seemed cooperative at first, but suspicions were raised when he attempted to run off. However, he was quickly caught and taken to the Tampa Police Department to be questioned about the morning's events. Initially believing that they were dealing with a distraught father, it was agreed that Hank would be taken back to the house in order to walk the detectives through what had happened that morning. Something wasn't quite right about Hank's story, as he initially said that Joey had been dragging the rifle behind him when it discharged, but then said that he himself had been putting the rifle away when it accidentally went off. Two police detectives, 46-year-old Ricky Childers and 44-year-old Randy Bell, took Hank back to the scene and at around 2pm left to return to the police station. Less than a mile from their destination, Hank managed to escape from his handcuffs. His hands had been handcuffed in front of him, not behind, and unbeknownst to the officers, Hank, a serial offender, always carried a handcuff key on a chain around his neck. Free from the handcuffs, Hank managed to grab Detective Ricky Childers' gun. He shot Ricky in the head, killing him instantly. The second detective, Randy Bell, tried to dive into the back seat to stop Hank, but he too was shot and killed. As Hank exited the police car, he shot at two truck drivers, one of whom, Christopher Espinoza, had to undergo surgery to rebuild his arm. The other truck driver, 26-year-old Kevin Luke, narrowly escaped a serious injury when the bullet hit the headrest of his seat. Hank then carjacked a 1997 white Ford Ranger and made his escape. He refuelled and then headed to visit his mother. When he saw her, he told her that Joey was dead and that it had all been an accident. As he was leaving, he turned to his mother and said, Mama, I got to go now. I love you. Kiss me. You'll never see my face alive again. It was clear that Hank had no intention of going back to prison. He headed towards Interstate 75 to start the 900 mile trip to see his daughter, Tamara, in Ohio. Less than half an hour after fatally shooting the two detectives, Florida Highway Patrol trooper James B. Crooks spotted the stolen Ford Ranger just south of State Road 54. James drove up behind Hank on the exit ramp for Interstate 75. As the traffic stopped, Hank jumped out of the truck and opened fire. A 20-year-old student, Tim Bain, witnessed the shooting. He saw Hank walk up to the patrol car and fire two shots before running back to the stolen truck. As he did so, another truck driver, who had also witnessed the shooting, drove straight at Hank, trying, but unfortunately failing, to stop him. Meanwhile, the student, Tim, noticed that the trooper's cruiser was rolling down the exit ramp. He managed to reach into the car and stop it. The highway patrol trooper, James, was dead inside the car. A frantic police chase followed with Hank often shooting wildly at the pursuing officers. Less than 30 minutes later, at around 3pm, Hank crossed the Hernando County line. Police officers were already waiting for him with a stinger to puncture his tyres. Hank retaliated by firing randomly. He hit the sheriff's helicopter, which managed to make a safe landing. Hank then pulled into a Shell petrol station where he continued to shoot at the police whilst running inside to take cover. 
Here, he took 27-year-old Stephanie Diane Kramer hostage. Surrounded on all sides by a massive police presence, Hank had run out of options. A standoff followed. As the police negotiators were brought in, they soon found themselves competing for Hank's attention with a local radio station, WFLA, who Hank called during the standoff for an on-air interview. During this interview, he provided his true identity and stated that Joey's death had been an accident. However, he showed no remorse for the policeman or the highway patrol trooper who he had just killed. He was only concerned about himself and how much he did not want to go back to prison. Eventually, the negotiators managed to contact the local telephone company and prevent Hank from making outgoing calls, so his only option would be to deal with the negotiators directly. The police agreed to let him talk to Bernice, who urged him repeatedly to surrender and to let Stephanie go. Hank kept saying that he would free Stephanie, but would then change his mind. After four hours, he eventually agreed to let her go. She ran from the building to safety and immediately expressed concern for Hank, the man who had held her at gunpoint for the previous four hours. During their time in the petrol station together, Hank had told Stephanie about the events of that day, how he had shot two detectives and a state trooper, how his boy had died and that he himself planned to die. He said that he planned to kill himself because he couldn't live with the thought that he had killed his child even though it had been an accident. Stephanie kept her composure, stayed calm and kept him talking. Before he freed Stephanie, Hank gave her letters for Bernice and Kayla, two photographs of Kayla that he carried with him, his shirt and $180 that he asked Stephanie to pass to Bernice. He also pulled the handcuff key from his pocket, explaining this was how he had escaped earlier in the day. The cheap master key could be bought for just a couple of dollars at that time. Hank put it onto his gold necklace and asked Stephanie to give it to Bernice without the police's knowledge. With Stephanie now safe, the police made their move. Tear gas canisters were fired into the building and the Tampa bomb squad set off two charges that were designed to blow holes in the walls of the building. When the dust cleared, they discovered Hank's body. He had shot himself in the head with a 9mm handgun. On the 20th of May 1998, a memorial service was held for state trooper James Crooks. 23-year-old James had been due to marry his fiancée Nadine Lamont in November that year. He had always wanted to be a police officer and had been on the force for less than a year. Ricky Childers had been on the Tampa Police Force for 21 years. He was married and had two sons. Randy Bell had been on the job for 18 years and was married with three daughters, two stepchildren and a grandson. One of his daughters now works for the Tampa Police Force. Evelyn, the mother of Hank's children, would later state that she was glad he's dead, live like that, die like that. Kayla was placed into foster care immediately after the attack, with both her mother and grandmother wanting custody. However, in 1999, Bernice was convicted of child neglect for allowing Hank near her children, and also with aiding and abetting Hank's escape, and being an accessory to the murders of her son and the three police officers. Even after one officer broke down and begged her to tell them Hank's real name, she refused to do so. Had the police known that they were dealing with a convicted felon from the start, rather than a grieving father, the whole day may have panned out differently. She was sentenced to 21 and a half years in prison. In 2001, these convictions were thrown out on appeal as the State Appeals Court found that the prosecutors focused too much on what Bernice should have done to prevent Hank's rampage, rather than what she did after the crimes were committed. She was subsequently acquitted of being an accessory to the murders of her son and trooper James Crooks. However, she was still convicted of child neglect, aiding and abetting Hank's escape and being an accessory to the murders of Ricky Childers and Randy Bell. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The sentencing guidelines called for 6 to 11 years, but when sentencing her, the judge stated that her lies to the police were so egregious that they endangered the public. Bernice was released in October 2016. Kayla was raised by her maternal grandparents. That concludes today's case. My heart goes out to the victims involved in this story this week. Joey, Ricky, Randy and James and also to all their respective families, friends and work colleagues. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. 
For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the case of Isabel and Linda Pedroza, a mother and daughter from Palm Beach in Florida. Isabel gave birth to Linda on the 18th of January 1983 when she was 33 years old. According to neighbours, Linda was a delightful little girl who grew into a friendly, hard-working young teenager, helping her mother with cooking and cleaning, and was often seen taking care of the family pets. However, her family life was difficult, with her father, Miguel, being arrested in the late 1980s and early 1990s on charges of battery and assault. As the years passed, Linda developed a rebellious streak to which her mother responded with increased discipline. Isabel was reportedly worried sick about her daughter who had fallen into a pattern of drug use, running away and having boys over whenever her parents were out. She became so concerned about her daughter's behaviour that she removed her from Duncan Middle School, enrolling her in a private school instead, and when this did not help or change things, she started to homeschool her. Isabel was self-employed, working in nearby Lake Worth, and would often take Linda to work with her. A neighbour can recall talking to Isabel about how strict she was with her daughter, likening this to her keeping her daughter as a prisoner. In early 2000, 17-year-old Linda had begun dating a 24-year-old man by the name of Antoine Wright. Antoine had recently been released from prison, having served two years for an aggravated battery charge. When Isabel returned to her house one day, she found the pair naked in bed together, and with that, the relationship between mother and daughter declined even further. Isabel developed a hatred towards Antoine, and reportedly began making racist comments about him. Linda decided that she wanted to move out to be with Antoine, but her mother threatened to call the police if she did so, as Linda was still a minor. By this time, Isabel and Linda would argue constantly, and the police were often called to their home. On the 29th of May 2000, Miguel was arrested on a charge of domestic battery and was held in jail. The following month, on the 27th of June 2000, Linda reported her mother missing. Linda told the police that she had last seen her mother on the 25th of June. She had returned home from Antoine's house at approximately 4am that morning and Isabel and Linda had spent the following day arguing. Later that day, Isabel said that she could not take it anymore, packed up the car and said that she was going to stay with relatives in Texas. Linda went on to tell the police that this was not the first time that Isabel had left her, so she was unconcerned at first. However, when she failed to turn up in Texas, nor return home or to work, Linda began to worry and reported her missing. In the photograph attached to the missing person's report, Isabel was wearing a distinctive orange and red beaded necklace that she had made for herself. On the 4th of July 2000, Surveyors working at the acreage made the gruesome discovery of decomposing human remains. The head, shoulders and upper body of the corpse were devoid of any flesh. When Detective R.J. Walfort was called to the scene, he immediately recognised the unique necklace on the body. Five days later, it was conclusively identified as Isabel through her dental records. Three days after the discovery of Isabel's body, her 1996 gold Kia Sophia was found parked at Palm Beach International Airport. The car contained items that looked as though they had been packed for her trip to Texas. It was not long before the police honed in on Linda and Antoine. By the 15th of July 2000, both were arrested and charged with the murder of Isabel Pedroza. They both confessed and were held without bond. Linda had told her friends that she was angry because her mother would not let her and Antoine be together. Despite only being months away from her 18th birthday and thus being able to make her own decisions, Antoine had told Linda that they wouldn't last if they had to wait until she was 18 to be together. The pair made the decision that Isabel needed to die. They initially thought about poisoning her before deciding to shoot her instead. They stole $100 of Isabel's money to buy bullets, and Antoine borrowed a gun from a friend. However, when they discovered that the bullets were too big for the gun, they came up with a new plan to kill Isabel and to dispose of her body. 
This was all based on a story that Isabel herself had told Linda. Linda had reportedly had a much older sister who had become pregnant at the age of 16. The baby's father, a married man, then whisked the young girl off to Tennessee where he killed her and doused the body in acid to hide the crime. How true this story is we do not know, but it sowed the seeds of a plan that would ultimately end Isabel's life. On the 23rd of June 2000, when Isabel returned from work, Antoine and Linda were waiting for her. Antoine hit Isabel with a frying pan with such force that the handle flew off. The pair then wrapped an electrical cable around Isabel's neck, pulling on either end. Once Isabel was dead, the pair went to the Waterway Cafe for a bite to eat before stopping at Home Depot on the way home. They bought four gallons of muriatic acid, which is usually used to clean stains from concrete and tiles. Returning home, they then attempted to dissolve Isabel's body in the bath, and when this did not work, they went and dumped her in the woods at the acreage, some nine miles from their home. Following this, they went to dinner at a Denny's restaurant in Miami, before going on a spending spree using $8,000 of Isabel's money, buying clothes, getting piercings, and having tattoos of each other's names. They then dumped Isabel's car at the airport. Antoine moved in with Linda, and the pair spent the following day spending money and having parties. One of Linda's friends, Lauren Lanning, would later state that everybody knew, everybody had heard what they did. They bragged about it. In her statement to the police, Linda said how her mother did not approve of her relationship with Antoine and went on to state, I really love him. I still love him right now. I swear I do. And that's why I did it. That's why I let him do it. As the pair were awaiting trial, details of their jailhouse letters were made public in October 2000. In one of them, Antoine confessed his undying love for Linda and begged her to help him beat the murder charge, stating that the key was for her to change a story implicating him in the murder and that she needed to adopt an alibi which he had concocted for them, stating, As long as you keep the same story you have now, I can't help you and I'm not going to allow you to lay down. If you change your story, believe it or not, we both can go home. He said that she needed to get her confession thrown out and that he had a friend who would say that they were both with him for the entire day of the murder. In another letter he stated, I will kill myself to be with you. If I have to kill my whole family just to prove my love to you, I will do it. Meanwhile, in her letters, Linda begged Antoine to repent and find God, having herself become a Christian. In a letter to a friend, Cracks between the pair finally began to show, with Linda stating, Yesterday, I heard that Antoine might be getting out. That's f***ed up. I hope it ain't true, because they let in the wrong person out. I hope you believe me. I swear on my life, I didn't do it. I'll go crazy if they let him go. Someone has to do justice. Linda also wrote to her father, saying that he should not worry about how she was being treated in jail, saying... I get treated like a little princess here. All the deputies love me, and the nurses too. I get extra trays all the time. Facing the death penalty, Linda was offered a deal of 40 years in prison if she testified against Antoine. She refused. The prosecutors then approached Antoine and offered him a deal of 20 years in prison if he testified against Linda, or life in prison if he did not. He accepted the deal to testify against her, and Linda's deal was withdrawn. With Antoine willing to provide testimony that could put Linda on death row, she pleaded guilty to the charge of second-degree murder, and with that received a 40-year prison sentence. On Friday the 20th of December 2002, Linda stood alone in Palm Beach County courtroom and admitted the details of her mother's murder. As Palm Beach County Circuit Judge John Hoy asked if she and Antoine had murdered her mother, Linda broke down in tears and after a pause of around 30 seconds, she quietly answered, yes. Following changes to the sentencing of minors by the US Supreme Court, lawyers asked the court to revisit her sentence on the basis that the 40-year term was unconstitutional because it was imposed without consideration of her age at the time of the offence 
However, it was decided that the judge who sentenced Linda to 40 years in prison did not make a mistake and her sentence still stands. It is clear that this crime was particularly brutal and horrific and harsh punishment was well and truly justified. But the disparity between the sentences is particularly striking. Both admitted to being involved in the murder. Antoine, an adult at the time of the murder with a history of violent crime, was released in February 2018. Linda, a minor with no previous criminal record, is still incarcerated with a scheduled release date of June 2036. That concludes today's story. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel and click like and comment down below. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Linda's half-brother, Fernando, knew something was wrong when Linda told him his mum went to Texas without the dogs. She wouldn't do that. Goodbye.